Hello, readers. Kristen Olson is a Portland-based writer and author whose newest book is titled Sweet in Tooth and Claw, Stories of Generosity and Cooperation in the Natural World. Kristen, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Great. So what was your goal with this book? <laughs> well, one one personal goal was to have fun with it. I mean, it was just so great talking to all these different researchers and different people on the ground doing great thing in landscapes. You know, I guess in, in terms of other people, um, my goal was to share the, the the fact that there's all this research that's been going on for, you know, 40 years or so, showing that um, nature is a lot more cooperative and connected uh, by cooperation than we tend to think, you know, that we tend to think of nature as being red in tooth and claw, uh, but in actuality, um, much of it is quite sweet in tooth and claw. Hmm. Chapter one is titled Underground Tapestry of Give and Take. Suzanne Samard is a University of British Columbia ecologist whose Mother of Tree Project, which is a culmination of her life's work, looks at how to best harvest trees in a way that keeps the forests themselves healthy. What did you learn about this process during the time that you spent with her in 2017 or so? Well, I learned that doing that kind of research is really a lot of work. You know, it's schlepping, schlepping a lot of equipment into the middle of the forest and it, banging your fingers trying to uh, put tags on the trees that you're going to watch for the next 30 or 40 years. Um, I learned, I mean, I think that the main thing that I learned, I had already learned from listening to her speak that, and she, she was really the inspiration for this whole book honestly, because I heard her speak about her research showing that um, that forests are knit together underground by this vast expanse of uh, fungi, my uh, hyphae, you know, these threads from the fungi underground that are just knitting together the forest floor and connecting these trees and providing resources to different plants when they need those resources. So I, I already understood that. And I understood that that was a incredible and exciting thing. So that's why I talked myself onto this research project with her. Um, the whole concept of the mother tree though, is as you said, to try to figure out ways of harvesting um, uh, trees differently in these tree plantations. And um, so she's looking at different patterns of, you know, leaving a, one of the biggest, oldest trees, which she calls mother trees, in, in an area of leaving that one there and, you know, cutting some others and, you know, all these different permutations of, uh, of harvesting trees. And then researchers are going to be looking at these plots for decades, trying to figure out which ways um, are contribute to the overall health of the, of the forest, maintain the overall health of the forest. You know, one of the things that was just so fascinating for me though, was learning when I was out there with her, um, that, that, you know, we can see with our eyes that some trees are the mother trees, some trees are bigger and, um, but we have no idea that that means that they are, therefore they have more, therefore cultivated more relationships with the other trees in the forest, with, uh, the the uh, fungi that colonize them through these uh, mycorrhizal, what are called mycorrhizal connections. So all those fungal threads that are spread out underground, they are making contact with the roots of the trees and colonizing them, either piercing them or looping around them. And through those sort of nodes of connection, there's water going back and forth, there's carbon going back and forth, there are other nutrients going back and forth, there are chemical messages going back and forth. Um, and those mother trees have, they are the oldest trees in the forest and they have connections with the oldest um, fungal families that are down there in the ground. So it's just, it's kind of like, I mean, it, you know, it's so analog analogous to human society where, you know, our our elders 
have cultivated relationships over the years and and strengthen members of our society through those connections and through their wisdom. And, you know, in a way, mother trees are doing the same thing. And it's not just about the plant life in these networks. How do animals, including things like dead salmon, contribute to this forest network? Well, um, yeah, that's another fascinating piece of research that one of her students has been conducting. So, you know, we always think of salmon, you know, when they make these heroic journeys from way out in the ocean, back up rivers and creeks, back to where they were spawned. We always <laughs> think of that as a... Um, as something that's really a boon to human fishermen and to the bear and to the coyotes and to the eagles and all these other creatures that are waiting eagerly for this bounty of protein to head up river. Um, but it turns out that, um, that the salmon, as they migrate up these streams back to their spawning grounds, that they cast what is what researchers call a salmon shadow over the land. And what that means is that they are bringing a very specific kind of nitrogen from deep in the ocean um, up into the land. So they're fertilizing the land. And when these, the bear and the eagles and the coyotes and all these creatures, they eat part of those um, salmon carcasses and then they sort of drop the rest in the forest. And there it starts to decompose. And there those nutrients are grabbed by the, the, that uh, network of fungi underground and distributed through the forest so that there's this very specific, very important form of nitrogen that comes from the deepest parts of the ocean way into land where it fertilizes the forest. Mutualism is the beneficial relationship between two living organisms where both end up benefiting from that relationship. For instance, bees and pollinating plants share a mutualism. How do bees sometimes cheat this process and how detrimental is that to the plant? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a funny, uh, funny realm of research. So I went to Crested Butte, Colorado to follow researchers that were running around uh, watching bees as they went in to, to get uh, pollen and nectar. So some bees, especially sort of some of the fatter bumblebees have a tough time getting into those long tubular flowers. So instead of climbing in from the top the way they're supposed to, um, and in a way that benefits the flowers the most, they sometimes gnaw a hole in the side of the blo blossom and, um, and get their nectar without um, getting coated in the pollen that, you know, uh, it, it's really, uh, it, it it helps. It's kind of like, it's what I called in the book, a third party mating. You know, they're, when they go into these flowers, they're getting coated with pollen, then they go off to other flowers and some of that pollen gets deposited. And that's all these, all these plants are getting fertilized and what enables them to go to, you know, bear, you know, bear fruit and, have seeds and all that. But so, so researchers call this thing that bees do cheating. You know, they're cheating this mutualism. And uh, it sort of tur turns out that it doesn't, you know, that, that the, the, the plants um, produce so much nectar that, you know, there's always going to be another bee or another hummingbird or something like that comes that comes along and um, makes up for the deficit that the bees, the the, the few bees that come in through the wrong entrance um, cause. So it doesn't seem to be a problem with flowers. That's good to hear. So Krista, most people have heard of natural selection, but what exactly is relaxed selection? That is just one of the, the favorite things that I learned when I was writing this book. So relaxed selection. So natural selection, you know, Darwin posited that uh, nature Nature is hard. It's hard to make a living out there. And that there are all these uh, natural variations within a species. And that the, 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 the creatures or the plants, whatever, that have the best characteristics are best able to stand up to the vicissitudes of nature and they survive. So natural selection picks out the ones that are best designed. But it turns out that... Um, there are all sorts of ways that 
that selection process can be eased and that's called relaxed selection. So sometimes it is through things that are, have nothing to do with anything that the, 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 the creature is doing different or, the, or, or ways that the characteristics that the creature has, you know, there might be, um, there might be a sudden excess of the of the things that creature likes to eat. So that would be relaxing their so it means that they have an easier time feeding themselves or some other thing. And then um, the other part of that is that a lot of creatures are relaxing the selection themselves by the things that they do in the world to make their lives easier. So beaver, you know, beaver make dams and they make lodges and they expand creeks so that they, you know, make these big ponds so that the beaver and their family and also the muskrat, which seem to uh, seem to be guests in beaver lodges often. Anyway, so that the beaver are safer within that pond. Um, humans relax selection by, you know, just think of all the things we do to make ourselves safer, to make our cities stronger, to, you know, I mean, it goes all the way from traffic lights to, um, you know, bike helmets. And uh, I mean, we can think of a, a thousand ways that that we relax selection. And sometimes the way that works in nature is, is just kind of, and, and really every, I mean, now I think of every mutualism, which is a, which is that beneficial relationship between two or more species. I think of every mutualism now as being an example of relaxed selection. So uh, when you get to the building blocks of not only human beings, but every other living thing that we see, you know, other animals and plants and fungi, we are all made of these cells called eukaryotes. And eukaryotes, um, when, when Earth first started having life, it was single-celled life. So 3.8 billion years ago, they think, that's when single-celled life developed. And then a couple of billion years ago, one of those ancient single-celled microorganisms and another one of those ancient single-celled microorganisms came together and fused into a new kind of single-celled organism um, that has, you know, that's more uh, internally complex. And those cells were able, had the capacity of forming multicellular things. So all of life that developed after that was from that initial act of collaboration, that initial relaxed selection. So one of the those ancient microorganisms was getting a safe home inside the other and the other microorganism was generating energy for the other so uh, you know i kind of now after after learning about this concept i kind of think of every mutualism as being a form of relaxed selection and i kind of think of every nice thing that we humans do for other humans that that's kind of you know every time we donate to somebody's go fund me because they've uh their house has burned down or they've got an illness that's an act of relaxed selection right it's also helping out a family member if you go far enough back but we are related to every living organism if you go far enough back including uh, billions of years in some cases the chapter titled We Are Ecosystems, speaking of humans, does deal with humans and the organisms living within us, either permanently, temporarily. They can be beneficial. Sometimes they can be harmful. Interestingly, viral infections have likely helped with human evolution. How so? Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. So as as uh, the researcher uh, Marilyn Rusink, uh, who I talked to, who was like the the main viral researcher, uh, told me. She said, "You know, most of them aren't. Most of them don't mean any harm. Most of them aren't bad." Um, and she said that she hopes that someday that we look at uh, viruses with the same kind of nuanced way that we now look at bacteria. But yeah, most of the viral infections that we have don't harm us. In fact, we are constantly infected by viruses. We we have viruses living in our mouths constantly. We have them living on our skin. We have them living in our gut constantly. They are 
uh, part of that immense microbiome that we have. And, uh, you know, in some of the, in, in ways that scientists don't even completely understand yet, some, I mean, some of them are just there, but some of them are probably doing us some good in ways that we don't quite understand. But looking back over human history, viral infections have been responsible for much of who we are now. You know, scientists estimate that 40 to 80 percent of the human genome stems from ancient viral infections. And, um, you know, part of uh, part of our our uh, material, our genetic material that um, supports our nervous system and supports higher order thinking comes from an ancient viral infection. And the way that we produce our young comes from an ancient viral infection. So it was an ancient animal that was infected by a, a virus and um, it's it sort of set up the biological machinery to form placentas, which is you know, how mammals have children. That is fascinating. Jack Gilbert is a professor of both pediatrics and oceanography at University of California, San Diego. What a combination there. He told you that humans emit about 38 million bacteria and 7 million fungi each year. Now, I get the bacteria part because of what you just mentioned, the microbiome in our guts, on our skin, uh, in our mouths, and our brains. But fungi, Kristen? Yeah, we've got, we, <laughs> yes, we're loaded with fungi. We're loaded with protozoa. We're loaded with viruses and bacteria. I mean, they're covering us. Actually, you said that we emit those in a year. I think he was saying we emit those in a day. Am I wrong about that? Uh, you may be uh, each hour. I'm sorry, each hour, which makes those numbers even more impressive. Which 38 even million crazier. bacteria and seven and he, million fungi. And he said, every you know, we're emitting them from our mouths. We're emitting them from you know when we. I'm emitting them when I'm waving my hands around. He said, every time we're sitting down, we're uh, emitting. You know, scientists love to talk dirty. We're emitting them through our butts. You know, we're just <laughs> we are we're kind of like Pin Pan. You know, the the old peanuts cartoon character with that swarm around him we are like that all the time so we've been told by public health experts over the past two plus years that we should limit hugging kissing hand holding other intimacies to reduce the spread of COVID-19 now a lot of those things are relaxing thankfully but beyond the obvious physical bond formed through these actions why is the spread of germs not always necessarily a bad thing well, you know, scientists wondered about this for a long, long time, especially when science held the view that, you know, bacteria and virus, all, the, all these things are germs and germs are bad. Um, and that was a view that was held for a very long time. But then they wondered, well, every culture, every human culture has some form of touching, you know, there's shaking hands, there's hugging, there's kissing among strangers or people who just meet, there's rubbing noses, there's, you know, all these practices that almost every human culture has, you know, why is it that we survived if we're spreading germs around all the time? And many animals have those, um, have those habits, have those cultural habits too. And, you know, it turns out that what we're doing when we're, when we're doing, um, when we're doing all that touching is that we are, we are spreading our germs. We are spreading um, some of our microbiome to somebody else. We're shedding some of that microbiome to somebody else. And that that can have a positive effect because it builds, a, it can build up their microbiome. And it, it turns out, you know, the, the microbiome is like uh, 35 trillion bacteria. You know, it's this, massive, massive amount of uh, microorganisms that live in us and on us, you know, in our eyes, in our noses, in our ears, in our, in every hair follicle. Um, and all of those, um, all of those tiny, tiny things, um, you know, some of them are just there. Some of them are just there. Some of their, um, some of them are there because they benefit from some relationship to each other but mostly they're there because they're benefiting us because they impact our uh, metabolism. They, they impact our brain function. They 
do all these services. They in, impact our digestion mightily. They they do perform all these services for us. Um, so I lost track of what I was saying, <laughs> where I was going. That's all right. I, I wanted I wanted to ask specifically about the gut microbiome. How does sugary yeah. junk food, which is obviously way too large a percentage of the standard American diet, how does that sort of food affect the gut microbiome? Well, bizarrely, it sort of sets off a food fight in our in our digestion system. There are certain microbes that really love sugar. And our own body cells want that sugar too. So there's a little bit of struggle that goes on between those two parts of our digestive system. But And what happens, uh, how it affects us negatively is that those, those microbes that are so drawn to the sugar are generally microbes that are pathogenic. And if they start to proliferate, the more, you know, the more we feed something in our uh, gut microbiome, you know, whether we're, whether we're eating a lot of greens, then we're preferentially feeding the microbiome microbes that like greens, or if we're eating meat, we're preferentially feeding those meat eating microbes. So those sugar eating microbes are largely pathogenic. And when we're preferentially feeding them, that means that their population grows. And then they kind of like, um, block the spaces, block the the road for the more beneficial microbes to uh, take a take their place. So we're sort of upsetting the balance of good and not so good microbes that live in us. You hope that uh, people start to heed that message uh, much more seriously than we than many of us have up to this point. One of the more fascinating chapters in this book, Kristen, was titled Transforming Deserts into Wetlands. You visited an area of northeastern Nevada that has been turned from a desert to a wetland. How'd they do it? Well, it's funny because they didn't even set off to do that. That wasn't even their intention at the beginning. So it it started with an effort among some scientists to um, get the creeks in that area healthier. So eastern Nevada, it's it's a it's a really hot, barren area, and there are just these threads of um, creeks and streams that go through there and everybody, uh, those creeks and streams are really important to everybody because there's so little water in that area. And, um, the scientists wanted the creeks to, to get healthier, more water in them a little deeper. So, uh, to protect a local trout. So they started talking to the ranchers about, um, changing their, uh, gr- changing the grazing practices of their animals. And the ranchers were at first, you know, kind of not crazy to be on board with this. You know, they sort of thought, well, this is the way the West has always been. It's always been dry. It's always had these dry creeks. It's, you know, creeks that, you know, have a trickle during some parts of the year and dry up during the summer. It's always been that way. Nothing we do is going to make a difference. But because I think largely largely because they wanted to try to have a good relationship with these scientists and government agencies that, you know, have a big influence on their business. Um, some of these ranchers started to change the grazing practices of their animals. And that meant letting them go by the creeks for a certain part of the year, um, but then the, the, then excluding them from the creeks for another part of the year. And that was a lot of extra work for the ranchers. You know, it was different from the way they usually did, which was just turn them out into the landscape uh, in early spring and bring them back into their paddocks, it, you know, when it got, when the weather got too tough. Um, and and what started to happen, I mean, it's just, it's really one of those things that just feels to me like the magic of nature. So as the, as the uh, creek banks, you know, the cattle were kept away, then the seeds that are in the soil. So, you know, most of us don't realize this because we, you know, we buy seed packets to plant and it says plant by, you know, March, 2023, but a lot of seeds can last a lot longer. Some seeds can last dozens of years. Some seeds can last hundreds of years. Some have even lasted thousands of years. So there are in every 
piece of soil, there are seeds just waiting for the right opportunity to germinate. And then, you know, birds are dropping in seeds and the wind is blowing in seeds. Anyway, pretty soon the banks of these creeks started to sprout with all sorts of vegetation, you know, many kinds of things that grow near water, but especially willows. And so the ranchers were pleased about that. Um, even though, again, it made their job a little harder, moving the cattle around all these. And then the beaver arrived and the beaver started, uh, you know, cutting down the willows and cutting down some of the other things there and building their dams. And the ranchers were like, come on, you wanted the willows there. Now, what are the beavers doing? Well, you know, maybe this is a problem. And they didn't really like beaver. You know, they ranchers have had a long history of battles with beavers because beavers get in there and mess up their irrigation systems and do things that they found troublesome. Um, but anyway, the government scientists and the government agencies and you know, everybody was saying, well, let's just wait, let's just wait and see what happens. Well, the beaver, the, the combination of the changed grazing practices and the growth of the riparian vegetation and the arrival of the beaver just started to trans transform these landscapes, you know, from these little trickles of streams, the beaver's stems made ponds and the ponds started to leach out into the landscape. And, it, it, you know, and then the riparian vegetation reached out into the landscape and the, the ponds got bigger and bigger and the creeks changed, you know, instead of these be there being these straight shots through the landscape, the creeks developed all these curves and oxbows and all that. And anyway, they did start to develop wetlands. Um, and, and the landscape has been, I mean, not the, the complete landscape, you know, when you get away from those wetlands, you see some pretty arid areas, but, you know, it helped, it helped, it wound up helping the ranchers in so many ways, you know, for one thing, it made their, their lands less um, susceptible to wildfire. It created, you know, these wet meadows where there was actual fodder for their animals, and the creeks stopped drying up in the middle of the summer. The Creeks stayed wet all summer. So it's just been a phenomenal, it's been a, a phenomenal change of the uh, the geology, the landscape, the, 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 the physical landscape, but, but it's all also been a phenomenal change to the cultural landscape because for all of this to work, for these different projects to work, the ranchers and the government agent agency uh, staff and the scientists formed these collaborative groups to talk through what was going on and to talk through every problem that came along and and figure things out together. And these are groups that usually butt heads a lot, um, and it it created these fabulous collaborative empathetic groups uh, of people working together. So, you know, both of those, I mean, I just, I just love that story of the, of the ranchers and, and the people there in Eastern Nevada. I think it's, it's uh, on two levels. It's a really hopeful, warming story. That's one of my favorites as well. The chapter titled Agriculture That Nurtures Nature deals with regenerative agriculture. What is regenerative ag agriculture? So regenerative, I mean, there's people define it many ways, but the way I define it in the book is that it's agriculture that uh, values soil health, you know, the, the health of the soil, which is determined by the vibrant population of uh, microorganisms there. So the health of the soil um, that values overall biodiversity, that um, seeks to yield a nutritious farm product and seeks to have a good income for the farmer. And Buzz Clute not only has the coolest name in this book, but he's also an aquatic scientist at the University of South Carolina. What did he learn about the fertilizer needs of regenerative farmers? Because that was a concern that was raised as more have gotten into regenerative farming. Right. 
So, I mean, he's an aquatic scientist. So what's he doing working with farmers? Um, and it turned, you know, I asked him that and it, he said, you know, he was just, he was in mourning as an aquatic scientist because he saw all these creeks and rivers getting um, silted up and polluted by farm chemicals. And uh, he thought there was no way to do anything about it because he didn't think that farming could change. And then he met some of these uh, regenerative farmers that weren't using any fertilizer at all and were growing, you know, very robust crops. And, and they were telling him, well, it was just the, it was just the, um, it was the way they were treating the land. It was the, the diversity of crops on their land that was providing the actual fertilizer to their plants. So he was shocked by that and started to look into it. And he discovered that, um, there are all these uh, recommendations out there that come from um, um, university extension services in different states and that farmers could be getting really dramatically different recommendations just depending on which state they were in uh, for how much fertil fertilizer they're used. You know, that, that, some, that there could be a border and on one side of the border there could be, you know, completely different recommendations. And he found that the recommendations um, were based on old science that looked at, you know, very conventional agriculture. So agriculture um, as it's practiced still in most of this country, which um, is monoculture agriculture, you know, so it's one crop being grown for acres and acres and miles and miles which is so antithetical to the way nature grows things. So it's one crop and usually that one crop is, is separated, you know, it's planted in rows and those rows are completely bare because farmers use herbicides to kill anything that'll grow between them because they assume that, um, that, though, that anything that grows there other than the crop plant is gonna steal nutrients and water from the crop plant. So it's monoculture, it's, it's uh, herbicides, it's pesticides. You know, they assume that the plants don't have enough strength and resilience to hold off insects. Um, anyway, it's all of that with industrial agriculture. And um, when, when crops are grown in that industrial model, um, they are deprived of the natural fertilizing relationships that they get with, um, that they get uh, if they were grown um, in a more natural way. So um, like a corn, you know, a corn plant, the corn, any plant is um, uh, making a carbon fuel through photosynthesis. So in through photosynthesis, they're creating this carbon fuel that they use to grow their own leaves and shoots and roots and fruits and all that. But every plant shares 40% and sometimes much more of that carbon fuel with the organisms in the soil. And they're exuding that into the organism through their roots, the organisms in the soil. And in turn, like in the forest with the, the fungal connections, in turn, those creatures, those those living things in the soil are bringing the plant, the corn plant in that instance, um, nutrients and water and things that they need. But in a in conventional agriculture, the plants aren't, uh, the, the soil is so debased that the plants aren't getting any nutrients through that system. So farmers in that, in that, um, in that, uh, growing culture do need to use more fertilizer. But if farmers are growing things in a regenerative way, or some, some people call it an agroecological way, in a way that's paying attention to the, um, the uh, relationships among living things, um, then they're growing, then they're growing um, a crop plant, but they're growing a cover crop or a companion crop in between there. So the, the soil microorganisms are, are being fed constantly and they're being, the soil is being protected and 
And in regenerative agriculture, people aren't plowing. They're not digging up the soil and destroying those uh, communities of soil microorganisms. So the, the soil is healthier. And in regenerative agriculture, um, that that row of cover crops or companion crops, they are attracting beneficial insects to the field so that the farmers don't need to spray uh, pesticides because those beneficial insects are eating the crop insects. So there's, it's a, just a completely different system. And so Buzz Clue, what through some testing with uh, uh, regenerative farmers, was able to show that they need far, far less fertilizer and sometimes none. And you tell uh, a great story or paint a really nice picture about natural pesticides with the I'll Take My Coffee with Birds chapter. People are just going to have to read the book to hear that one. In the chapter tile, uh, titled Healing from Ridgetop to Reef, you discuss coral, coral, which is one of the best examples of uh, mutualism on this planet. What exactly is coral snot, Kristen? <laughs> So coral itself is, as you said, a great uh, a bedrock of mutualism. So every coral is a, is a mutually beneficial relationship between a little animal, a little coral animal that um, swallows an algae. So that algae, the, the coral, little coral animal uh, gives a home to that algae and protects it. And that algae gives energy, produces energy for the coral. So they build up these reefs and the reefs are covered with kind of a slime. Um, and actually anybody who's picked up a fish that comes right out of the water and there's a slime on the fish, that's called fish snot. Hmm. The same kind of thing. It's, it's, it's like a mucus that covers the coral reefs. And when scientists first started to look at this mucus and try to figure out what was going on with it, they saw some bacteria in it. And that was back in the old days when if somebody saw bacteria, they'd say, oh my God, there's, it's, it, it must be attacking the coral. But no, it turns out that this, this coral snot is like a, a medium for all these different microorganisms to grow in. And it turns out that they not only um, the coral snot and these microorganisms that live in it not only protect the coral reefs from disease, but also provide it with all these, like, provide it with minerals, provide it with vitamins, provide it with um, nutrients, provide it with other chemicals that help it survive. It's, it's just kind of like a, uh, a magic coating. And how do island birds help coral? Another really fascinating mutualism. So um, one of the things that they've found that really benefits uh, coral reefs and that has become a problem because so many islands, because of uh, human settlement, because of humans accidentally, or in the case of some ancient humans uh, on purpose, humans bring rats and rats proliferate on some of these small islands and eat the eggs of uh, these seabirds. And um, when the seabird population is uh, strong, these seabirds fly out over the ocean hunting and they poop. <laughs> and there's a special form of nitrogen in their poop that enriches the coral. Um, and it's, and I, so I was asking the researcher looking into this and I said, well, if that form of nitrogen is enriching the coral, um, yeah, cause I know that I had, I'd read that, um, the kind of nitrogen that comes from, uh, human, <laughs> human poop and human agriculture, um, the kind of, is a, it's a form of, a form of nitrogen that's used in chemical fertilizer. I said, well, does that fertilize, does that uh, give a boost to the coral reef? And no, that's a different form. So the coral reef, the corals have, a, you know, adapted over, evolved over millions of years to use that, the form of nitrogen that comes from the seabirds. They have not evolved to use the nitrogen. And it actually, the nitrogen that comes from our agriculture and from our poop. 
um, because uh, it, 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 it actually uh, weakens the coral reefs. So the goal of these researchers is to help build up the populations of these um, sea island nesting birds so that they can once again poop on the poop on the reefs. And finally, Kristen, you end this book with a focus on cities. 80% of Americans and more than half of the world lives in cities. Many cities have tried to better nature up the urban sprawl, if you will. Dallas put a park atop part of a highway that they built several years ago. Austin, where I'm located, seemingly uh, builds a new high rise each month. And a lot of these newer high rises have started planting trees, not only on the roof, but at various levels on the way up. My kids actually love pointing them out when we're driving through downtown. Have these sorts of efforts that cities are making shown to be worthwhile? Oh, they're so worthwhile. You know, I think that they're in, they're essential. I think as as we go into a warmer, not only a warmer climate climate, but um, a more unpredictable climate. You know, now when it rains, it pours. Uh, it either doesn't rain in places where it used to rain, and sometimes it just pours and everything floods. So, yes, all those tree planting efforts, all that all that addition of greenery to cities, it cools the cities. I mean, that's a huge part of it. Um, I think the the the, the the number is that the those cooled, shaded sidewalks, uh, surfaces where um, greenery is in cities is 45 degrees cooler than unshaded surfaces, which is phenomenal. Um, and it's uh, so often it's a it's a um, issue of equity. You know, often in the poorest neighborhoods and cities, those are the areas that cities haven't invested in street trees and neighborhood greenery. And uh, there's a, a researcher here in Portland um, named uh, Vivek Chandas who went around with a heat gun during um, during a, a really hot spell here last summer. And, you know, the, the neighbor, the neighborhoods where there weren't those street trees was just brutally hotter, but brutally, brutally hot. So it's, it's not only essential that we green our cities to cool them down. I mean, cities are just naturally hotter than the surrounding countryside anyway, because of all the hard surfaces. So we need that greenery to cool it down. We need that greenery and those rooftop gardens and those, extra parks and all that stuff to absorb water. Um, we need we need all that, that greenery for our own health. I mean, so many of the uh, microbes that we need to interact with live on greenery. So we want that there. I mean, there have been so many studies that have shown that not, you know, I used to see some of the, I, I used to see uh, people referring to studies saying that you know, if you just saw a green, you know, a picture of a green tree or looked out a window and saw a green tree that you uh, got healthier. And um, so I used to just think, oh, I guess it's just a psychological impact. But no, you know, people are finding more and more that it's a physiological impact, that there are chemicals that um, trees and microbes exude that are important to our health. Um, there have been... Uh, uh, studies in cities of people and in, in public housing projects that ones that had trees and greenery and ones that didn't and people's mental health and everything about their lives was just better when they had when they had greenery around them so i think for every single reason just about every reason that we can think of and i think that you know one of the um things that was so thrilling about writing that chapter and, and interviewing the people uh, that I spoke to for that chapter was looking at the example of Singapore. You know, Singapore is like the poster child of greened cities. And, um, you know, I think that we have this, this sort of uh, zero sum game view of like, well, if we're going to have nature there, then there won't be enough room for humans. But no, you know, they have shown that that is not the case, that the that their city grew by 2 million people. And at the same time, their urban canopy grew, and I can't remember the number, but grew substantially. So through really mindful greening, you know, really mindful planning, we can 
bring nature into our cities in ways that um, doesn't cramp our style. It, it is actually going to enhance our lives. As much as people may not realize this, putting yourself in nature is so good for many reasons. I mean, you just listed some of them, but if nothing else, especially like where you live in Portland, where I live in Austin, your attention is constantly being drawn to things that literally could be life or death if you're really being that oblivious to it all. So to even just look at a tree outside your window, like I can do right now as we're having this conversation, it allows you to just completely relax and be in the moment and not really have to worry about anything. And if nothing else, I think that kind of replenishes that attention resource that is necessary in just about every other minute of your waking life. Right. I mean, you know, the word that, um, the word that, you know, I went to the, I went to this conference uh, in Paris of called the nature of cities. And it was brought together these visionaries from around the world who are figuring out ways, you know, some of the ways are tiny, but figuring out ways of, of bringing, of having the rest of nature flourish in our cities with us. Um, anyway, it was just, uh, really really fabulous uh sounds like it and uh something else that's fabulous is your new book she is kristen olson the new book is sweet and tooth and claw stories of generosity and cooperation in the natural world you can get it now wherever books are sold kristen thank you so much for the time today and thank you for this book great to talk to you and i had so much fun writing this book so i hope people have fun reading it i think they will thank you so much kristen thank you Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to Joshua Bates for the video editing. If you have any video editing needs, hit him up on Instagram at Forager Digital. Thanks as always to you for checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.